shop. I belong to State Street Church, and I'm very grateful they've accommodated us and given us this space. If you'd like to do make a donation to the church, there's a bride at this point to the offering plate. Um, That's what I do. <laughs> so um, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Maria Benjamin, and I have tremendous respect for her. She is perhaps the most tireless peace worker on the planet. I know that says a lot. But Medea co-founded Code Pink, the women's peace group, at the, at the start of the Iraq War. It was really developed to protest the war, but they've gone on to really be an active force wherever there's a war or an uprising. Medea has been to South, South America, Central America, literally all over. She's been a voice for Afghanistan having their funds and pros, and she's done a lot of work with Cuba trying to get the, the, the government to uh, undo the sanctions there, which has made it really difficult for that country. Medea has written 10 books. The book she will talk, be talking about tonight is War in Ukraine, her latest book, which gives you a, a really important historical overview. And I, I think you'll be inspired by Medea's commitment to peace work. I really think of her as a modern day Dorothy Day. Dorothy Day, of course, devoted herself to eradicating poverty, but at the end of her life, she was very active in the um, anti war movement. So please join me in giving a big welcome to Medea Benjamin. Please remember to turn off your phone. So thank you so much. Can you all hear me okay? Yeah. 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 Good. Um, it's a pleasure to be here, and um, I think to start, I just want to say that it's a hard time to be a peace activist. Yeah. Um, raise your hand if you have friends who you've had some heated discussions with about the Ukraine war. <laughs> That's almost all of you. Uh, this is something that has really divided the peace movement mm -hmm. in so many ways. Um, I got a call from the New York Times recently, and uh, the uh, journalist said he was writing a piece on why there is so little opposition to the war in Ukraine. And I said, why do you say that? And he said, well, I went to Amherst, Massachusetts, where there's been a peace vigil every week since the 1960s from the days of the Vietnam War and I interviewed the people in the peace vigil and everyone in the vigil and there were only like seven people was in favor of sending more weapons to Ukraine <laughs> and uh, I said no that can't be that's that's impossible so yesterday we had a friend Oh no, uh, today was their Sunday, every Sunday peace vigil. So we had a friend go and talk to people. And sure enough, every single one of them was in favor of sending more weapons to Ukraine. So you got to scratch your head and say, why are they even doing a peace vigil? Why are they even calling it a peace vigil? Mm -hmm. Sending weapons to keep a war going is not peace. No. War is not peace. And... Um, it's just been so strange the way this has been manipulated and people have gotten so confused. Uh, I think of the Quakers and the, uh, the slogan that they have on a lot of their churches that just say simply, like Martin Luther King said, War is not the answer. Mm -hmm. And I think we have to just repeat that to ourselves over and over when we get confused, when we're talking to other people. War is not the answer. But that doesn't mean we don't condemn the invaders. And I am so tired of being called a Putin apologist because I say over and over and writing in the book, it's the first thing we say is to condemn the <coughs> Russians for this awful invasion of Ukraine. We've got to say that it's illegal, that it's immoral, that it's causing so much pain and suffering. And to get a firsthand view of that pain and suffering, because people have said to me, you don't care about the Ukrainian people. First of all, on my father's side, they are Ukrainian Jews. Uh, but I went a month ago to Western Ukraine to talk to people. And indeed, it was extremely painful to see every day the funerals that were taking place at the churches, 
uh, the mass graveyard just in the past year and a half that has hundreds of freshly minted graves and you see the wives grieving and the children leaving flowers for the fathers they will never see again, the pain and the suffering and people living with this tremendous sense of uncertainty. And yet you have to really say, well, how is this going to end? And why did this start? What could we do, we do to find a solution? And I find it so remarkable that in this country, when the war is talked about, whether it's coming from the White House or from Congress or from mainstream media, there's always the two adjectives. Does anybody want to say what they are? Talking about the war, it is... Unprovoked. unprovoked and unjustified. Oh, wow. So unjustified, yes, unprovoked. <coughs> you constantly hear that refrain, mm -hmm. unprovoked. Yeah. And we have to really know how to counter that, which is why uh, my colleague and I wrote this book, because it's a basic primer, which you can read, I've been told, in two sittings. It's quite readable. But it gives the basis for understanding just how it was that NATO and the U.S. violated everything that they had agreed to when the Soviet Union was falling apart and when they talked to Khrushchev and said, we will not move an inch eastward, and how they violated that over and over again with Republican and Democrat administrations, and the warnings kept pouring in. We have lots of quotes in the book of warnings that were coming from CIA, that were coming from US ambassadors in Russia at that time, foreign analysts, experts from think tanks, all saying this is going to destabilize the region. Mm -hmm. Russia cannot live with what they perceive as a hostile military alliance at their border, and they will be forced to react. They also said we have to recognize that there is tremendous division in Ukraine between the Western part, which has been traditionally more pro-European, and the Eastern part that's been traditionally more pro-Russia, mm -hmm. and a lot of ethnic Russians. And so when people say, if they say to you, well, the Ukrainian people, you've got to say, which Ukrainian people? Because there are different Ukrainian people who think different things. And so when I visited, and I talked to people, and said, you know, how is this going to play itself out? Where is this going? And they would say, we are going to fight to victory. This was in the West. And I said, what does victory mean? And they would say, victory means taking back every inch of the Donbass and taking back Crimea. And when I would say to them, well, Crimea is a very, very complex issue because it belonged to Russia for over 200 years. It's where Russia has its very important naval base, warm water port. Mm -hmm. Russia is not going to just pick up and leave Crimea. They say, hush, don't talk about that. We're not allowed to talk about that. It's treasonous. And indeed, if you turn on the TV when you're in Ukraine, what you see is every day examples of how Ukraine is winning. They just blew up these uh, Russian tanks. They just blew up a Russian ship. They've just taken back this village. And so people are convinced that victory is possible. And I think that's the same thing here in the United States because that is the same refrain we are hearing as well. But on the other hand, if you look at what the Pentagon is saying, and we know from leaked Pentagon documents that they say that this is a stalemate. Mm -hmm. And let's look at what's happening with the counteroffensive right now that was supposed to start in the spring. It didn't start. It was postponed to the summer. And a lot of pressure coming from NATO and particularly the US saying, we're giving you all these weapons. You better produce something. And so the Ukrainians were forced to go on this counteroffensive, and it's been going on for almost two months now, with a lot of Ukrainian soldiers dying every single day, as well as Russian soldiers, with very little to show for it. 
In fact, I'm surprised that even in some of the mainstream newspapers, like the Washington Post and the New York Times, they're starting to give a glimpse that this is not going well. If we say uh, that what the Ukrainians want is more and more weapons, and more dangerous weapons, more long-range weapons, we also have to see all of these lines that Biden has crossed when he said in the beginning, we're not going to give HIMARS, for example, and then did. We're not going to give the Patriot missiles, and then we did. We're not going to give the tanks, and then we did. We're not going to give the F-16s, and it certainly looks like they're going to get F-16s. Cluster bombs. I mean, unbelievable. This is a weapon that the U.S. was saying was being used by Russia and Ukraine, and the U.S. was saying what a war crime it is. And Human Rights Watch has, had also documented that the Ukrainians were using it. Cluster bombs are munitions consisting of a projectile known as a parent munition that transports several hundred bomblets, or cluster munitions. Dropped by aircraft or launched from the ground, cluster bombs are designed to be dispersed over a wide area the size of several football pitches. As these weapons are generally free-falling, they can strike the ground a considerable distance from the target area if they're not used correctly or if conditions are, for example, windy. In addition, not all bomblets detonate on impact. They thus become de facto anti-personnel mines, banned by the 1997 Ottawa Convention. Years after a conflict is over, they can kill dozens of people, including small children, attracted by their bright colours. By signing the Oslo Convention, more than 100 countries have pledged to clear contaminated areas. A long and dangerous task. And then the US goes in and gives way more of those cluster bombs that either side had been using. And this is a weapon that 123 countries came together and said no. And why did they say no? Because we've seen what happened in Laos, what happened in Afghanistan, what happened in Lebanon and so many other countries that long after the war ends, and we're talking even like decades after the war ends, there are farmers in their fields who step on a cluster munition. There are children who see a, a, a shiny thing and pick it up and get their legs blown off. And that's why people said this is a, a, an abominable weapon. We will not allow for it to be used. And then Biden says, oh yeah, we're going to give in and give them cluster munitions as well. I think what Zelensky really wants is for NATO troops to get involved. And that is very, very dangerous. In fact, that's one of the things that Biden has really been trying to avoid. He keeps saying, no, we're not going to send troops. But if indeed this counteroffensive is going so poorly, you can imagine that there will be more and more of a call for NATO troops. And there have been two occasions where it looked like the Russians had uh, uh, a missile that went astray and went into Poland. Uh, and in the 24 hours when they were investigating it, there were already calls for invoking Article 5. You know what Article 5 is? Article 5 is an injury to one is an injury to all. If you hurt a NATO country, then we will all get involved. And what is implied in that means uh, troops. And luckily in that case, it was not a Russian missile, it was a stray Ukrainian missile, but it could very well have been. Mm -hmm. Imagine with all these missiles and all these drones that are flying around, there's bound to be an accident or a false flag kind of operation to then invoke Article 5. So that is extremely dangerous. I mean, people who say that we should keep fueling this war, you have to say, you know, this can easily spread throughout Europe. This can easily be a third world war. And if um, the, the uh, NATO troops get involved, then it could easily turn into a nuclear confrontation. 
But then you get people who will say, well, you can't talk to Putin. And you can't negotiate because then that would be appeasement. Well, I think there's many ways to respond to that. One is to say, you have to negotiate with Putin because you don't negotiate with your friends, you negotiate with your adversaries. And that's who you have to talk to. The other is to recognize that there have been talks with the Russians going on on a number of different issues. For example, when a number of months ago, it looked like each side was accusing the other of shelling very close to the Zaporizhia nuclear plant, there was tremendous concern throughout Europe that that plant could explode. And they know that that radiation would not just stay within the bounds of Ukraine. And so there was a lot of pressure for the Ukrainians and the Russians to talk to each other so that staff from the International Atomic Energy Agency would be able to come in and monitor and try to calm things down. And indeed, that happened. For a long time, there was a grain deal that was functioning extremely well to create a land and a sea corridor to make sure that the millions of tons of grain from Ukraine was getting out and helping to ease the increase in the price of grain that was affecting people all over the world, particularly in poor African countries. Unfortunately, the Russians recently withdrew, suspended their participation in that saying that the, uh, the uh, um, parts of the deal that were supposed to also ease Russia's ability to export its grain and its fertilizer was not being implemented. But there are efforts right now to try to bring Russia back into that deal. There are also constant talks that are going on about prisoner exchanges, and there have been many prisoner exchanges, which I think you know, imagine how difficult it is in the midst of a war where there is so little trust among both sides to agree that you're going to take 100 people from this side and 100 people from that side and that you're going to actually do what you said and make that exchange happen. There have been thousands of prisoners that have been exchanged, as well as wounded prisoners, as well as bodies of soldiers. Um, so those talks have happened. The question is, what about talks to end the war? Well, there have been talks on that as well. And here we have to really understand that the time to talk to end a war is right in the beginning of that war. That all academics have shown that the best chances are within the first 30 days before the positions get really hardened. And that's why when Russia invaded, there was a clamoring from a number of heads of state, let's do something about it. And talks began. And the most successful ones were happening in Turkey from President Erdogan. And they actually came up with a 15 point plan. And that 15 point plan included neutrality for Ukraine, meaning it would not become a member of NATO. Russian troops would, would withdraw. There would be new referenda uh, internationally supervised in the Donbass, and the issue of Crimea would be put off for a number of years. Both sides were close to an agreement. And imagine, the war could have ended a month after it began if it had not been for the West that came in and said no. And that was in the person of uh, Boris Johnson from the UK who came in and said, no, we don't want you to make this agreement with Russia and we will not support this agreement. And we want you to fight to victory, get back everything. And we have the US Secretary of Defense, Lloyd Austin, who said we have to weaken Russia so that Russia would not do anything like this again. So just think what it means that the US and the NATO countries sabotaged an agreement. And not long ago, there were a group of African countries that wanted to help try to initiate peace talks and they met with Putin. And Putin pulled out and waved around this 15 point peace plan and said, here, we had it. We had an agreement. And yet it was sabotaged by the West. And for anybody who doesn't believe it, it came out in the 
Turkish papers and Turkish officials said it. It came out in a very pro-Western Ukrainian paper, which are the only papers that are allowed to be put out right now. Uh, and then there was a confirmation of that with the Prime Minister of Israel, at the, who at that time was Neftali Bennett. And he said that he, too, had been holding negotiations, which is quite ironic because if he wanted to deal with the conflict, he could have stayed home and tried to deal with his own conflict. But he got involved, and he said they were very close to a ceasefire and that the West blocked it. So here we have another example. I mean, this is really shameful, and we have to take responsibility for our government blocking peace agreements because it's going on now. It's been a constant. There have been other efforts like the Pope that has met with both sides and appointed a very prestigious envoy who's been involved in peace negotiations for decades uh, and sent him to uh, both Moscow and Kyiv as well as to the White House. Uh, and nothing has come of that. Uh, there have been those six African nations that I mentioned. Uh, there have been presidents from Latin America who have gotten together and pushed for uh, peace talks. And then there's China. China came up with its peace plan, which is really not any kind of developed peace plan. It's a set of principles. and. Um, it is remarkable because the first principle is actually one of respecting national sovereignty. And you would think that Ukraine would be all over that. In fact, Ukraine said that those principles were ones that could act as a beginning for negotiations. And the Russians said the exact same things. Who is the one that said, no, this is ridiculous? The US. And the White House spokespeople said, this is ridiculous to think that China could play a role as mediator because China is too close to Russia. And they also said that the, their peace plan would be ridiculous because you can't have a ceasefire now because that would be giving a rubber stamp to the territories that Russia has already claimed, which is ridiculous because that's why you sit down at the table to figure out what are you going to do about those territories. But the U.S. really pushed aside that Chinese peace plan. And that's why some of us in Code Pink went to a hearing when Anthony Blinken, the Secretary of State, who's supposed to be the number one diplomat in this country, and is an incredible war hawk, was coming to a hearing that was called U.S. Diplomacy for 2023. And as he started talking, uh, I got up and said, we want you to be a diplomat. Why don't you do your job? You don't like the Chinese peace plan. Where is your peace plan? And I got arrested as I started uh, with saying that. Um, but I think that's a really important question that we ask. Now, just last week, there was a gathering in Saudi Arabia that was supposed to be a, another venue for peace talks to happen. First of all, that's ridiculous to hold a peace talks in Saudi Arabia, where the de facto head of that country, Mohammed bin Salman, is the one responsible for murdering and then chopping up the body of a Washington Post reporter, Jamal Khashoggi, as well as it being one of the most repressive countries in the entire world, a kingdom. Uh, um, but nonetheless, um, they hold peace talks. And really, you know, I don't think on one level we should really care. If there are going to be good peace talks that can move something forward, you know, let, let's go forward. But uh, they invited all these different countries. And then it was reported in the US press that the Russians didn't show up. You know why the Russians didn't show up? They were not invited. They were not invited to the peace talks. So isn't that absurd to call these peace talks when the party that did the invading is not asked to come to be at the table? So we can't think of that as anything um, 
that that has uh, you know it's it's just absurd. And in fact, um, what it was to do was to talk about the Ukrainian peace plan, and the Ukrainian peace plan is a negotiating position. It says, give us back everything, leave, you're responsible for war crimes, and we want you to pay to rebuild. Now, I think that's a perfectly fine position for starters at the table, and Russia will say, all of the territory that we conquered is ours, Crimea is ours, we're not leaving Crimea, uh, and you better not join NATO. And that would be their position. That's what you call the starting positions for peace talks. But that's not what a compromise would look like. And of course, there has to be compromise. So uh, the question really is, if the US is the one that is stopping peace talks from happening, what does that mean for us? Well, so far it's meant that the majority of people in the Congress, both Democrats and Republicans, have been okaying uh, money after money to go to Ukraine. And I'm all in favor of money for humanitarian aid. Economic support is interesting. Where do you draw the line there? Uh, because we're basically paying the bills of the government. I think one time when Biden was speaking, uh, as he often does put his foot in his mouth, he said something like, yeah, we're even paying for the pensions of the Ukrainians. <laughs> and people in the U.S. said, what? We're not getting pensions here. Um, but the U.S. is giving 2 to $3 billion every month just to keep the lights on. And on top of that, it's been $46 billion for weapons. And now Biden has come in just this week and asked for another $24 billion for Ukraine. So the, the configuration of forces in the Congress right now is something that I have never seen before. And it just keeps my head spinning when I think that the progressive Democrats, who are usually the more peaceful people in Congress, are part of the war hawks. That at this point, we don't even have the one person back in the days of the Iraq war who voted against going to war, and that was Barbara Lee of Oakland, California, who has a seat that would never be contested. She wins by, you know, like 90%. Um, she is not with us. The squad is not with us. Bernie Sanders is not with us. You know who are the people? Yeah, um, so you ask why? Why? because there is a Democrat in the White House. And because when 30 of the progressive Democrats signed a letter back in October of last year, not questioning the weapons, not questioning the economic aid, saying in addition to the support that we are giving, it would be nice to start negotiations. And that was seen as such a no-no that immediately they were slammed down. And something I've never seen in all my years of activism is that within 24 hours, they withdrew that letter. Yeah. And since then, they have been silent on this. Well, worse than silent, because really, they have been participating in keeping this war going. And it's not only the money, it's all these different uh, amendments and uh, bills that have come forward to do things like, let's have an inspector general like we had in Afghanistan to see where all these billions of dollars are going. No, uh, let's do an audit to see where this money is going. No, um, there is one that came out recently that was a very, very, very mild amendment put forward by uh, a member of the Freedom Caucus, who, uh, his name is uh, Warren Davidson, and he was an army ranger, a very, you know, hawkish kind of guy. He put an amendment in that said uh, three things. It said, what is your definition of victory? Because that's very important. Is victory going back to where things were before the uh, recent Russian invasion, 
or is it going back to where things were in 2014, where Russia came in and took Crimea, and the Donbas uh, declared itself uh, in the breakaway republics? We don't know, because we've heard different things from this administration. So what is your definition of, of victory? What is your diplomatic path? How much is this going to cost us? And we want to report within 90 days. So just pretend for a moment that you're a member of Congress. Raise your hand if you would have said, yeah, that sounds kind of logical. Sure. Yeah. OK, so most of you raising your hand. Yeah. Well, it was interesting um, that there were quite a number of Republicans that voted for it, 129 Republicans. Uh, how many Democrats voted for it? Zero. Zero. Zero, Zero Democrats. <laughs> Zero. I mean, that is just unacceptable to not vote to have the president explain to us where he's going with this. So why, you ask? Once again, because they've been told it's an election time. It was election time at midterm elections. Now it's getting into presidential elections. We have to look unified as a party. <coughs> this is national security issues don't, uh, that you really don't know that much about. Let the president figure this one out. Well, I don't know how you feel about that, but they certainly couldn't figure out 20 years in Afghanistan. They couldn't figure out Iraq. Um, I don't think we should trust them to figure this one out either, because war has a momentum all its own, and you can't control where that is going. So it's up to us to really put the pressure on Congress. And I know there are people here who work to pressure Congress all the time, and there are other people here who are so cynical about Congress uh, that they say, let's not even bother. I do both. I mean, I am. Uh, I do the go into the Congress all the time, and I am so cynical about Congress. Uh, and yet, what else do we have? What else can we do? And there, I think, is a possibility as the American people's public opinion start changing as this war has gone on and on. Because despite the mainstream narrative and what we hear from the White House and Congress, which is, if you just give more weapons, if you just give this more time, the Ukrainians will win, um, the public opinion polls show that the American people get tired of war very quickly, and the majority now want to see peace talks. And even now, in the latest CNN poll that was taken in July, shows that 55% of the American people don't want to send more weapons to Ukraine. And I find that quite remarkable. And what's interesting there in the breakdown is you look at Republicans, and it's 71% of Republicans. Among Democrats, it's a much smaller percent. And guess who, when you break it even further, the smallest percent? Liberal. Democrats, liberal Democrats. So um, this has become a very nasty partisan issue. But yet, as we get closer into the presidential elections, I think it will become a, an albatross for the Biden administration. So if you get 55% of the people right now saying they don't want to send more weapons and a majority saying they want to ceasefire, you also have from Donald Trump to DeSantis to Robert F. Kennedy to Cornell West, uh, and to some extent, Miriam Williamson, saying they want to see a ceasefire. Uh, they want to see peace talks. And these people are reaching millions of people. And I think that's helping to shape public opinion and to turn public opinion. And then there are folks like us who are coming at it from a very grassroots perspective. I mean, I've been traveling around to lots and lots of cities. My partner here, Ty Berry, we should give him a hand because he's been enduring this. Uh, and sometimes with a lot of people protesting us and canceling my talks. Um, but we've been going around city to city trying to build things up. 
And in this vein, I'd like to pass around the sign-up sheet because we need to be in touch with you. And we're really encouraging you to please sign on to that. We'll have it go around. And um, uh, because we have things that are coming out constantly. I mean, just this week, the 24 billion came out. We didn't know they were gonna ask for more money so quickly. And then these uh, sheets, let's pass some of those out too. Um, these are the numbers of your senators and your congressperson uh, because uh, I would like to ask you to do just one thing tomorrow, which is make those three calls. We are told by our Congress people that the Ukrainian American community that wants to keep the US sending weapons is very active, very vocal, and is constantly calling Congress and that they don't hear from us enough. I don't know if that's true or just an excuse, but if you could all just make those calls tomorrow, that would be terrific. The other thing is that um, there will be other uh, bills coming up, like the one I mentioned that no Democrats voted for. In September, it will be a standalone piece of legislation and so we can go back to them and say, sign this piece of legislation that only asks for a report. Um, I think as we move forward and talk about you know, what can we do to change the balance of forces here, we must also recognize that we are part of a global community. And that global community has really been affected by this war. Unlike other wars that are very localized, this one has led to increased energy prices in many countries around the world. Uh, it has affected businesses throughout Europe, particularly in Germany. There were they were used to cheaper energy coming from Russia, and now U.S. energy companies are profiting from this by trying to take over that market. We see the countries in Africa that are now experience greater amounts of hunger because the price of foodstuffs have gone up because of this war. Uh, it has really led to a realignment of forces that we can talk about afterwards because there are actually some very interesting um, realignments that might bode well for a future of a much more multipolar world. But in the meantime, things are very difficult for many people around the world. And that is why even though uh, the majority of heads of states voted to condemn Russia at the United Nations, those same states that have condemned Russia have continued to trade with Russia, have continued to say we won't impose those sanctions because it hurts our interests. Many of them have also said we see this more and more as a proxy war between the United States and Russia, and we don't want to be forced to take sides. And one of the people I think who represents the global community is the president of Brazil, uh, known by the name of Lula. And he was invited by Biden to come to the White House. And one of the things Biden did, as he has done to a number of different countries, is pressure Brazil to send weapons to Ukraine. And when Biden came out of that White House meeting, he said, we will not send weapons to Ukraine. What this conflict needs- so When Lula comes out. When Lula came out. Yeah. This is not what this conflict needs. What the Russians need is interlocutors who will tell them what a terrible mistake they made by invading Ukraine, and will tell the Ukrainians how important it is that they go to the negotiating table with the Russians. He said, we do not want to join this war, we want to end this war, and I think that reflects I hope the sentiment in this room and more and more the sentiment of the American people. We don't want to keep fueling this war and see more and more Ukrainians and Russian soldiers being killed. We want to end this war. Thank you very much. So I think we have time for discussion. Yes. I, to the detriment of my mental and physical health, I watch corporate news just to keep up with this. Good. 
good for you. And it, just in case anyone doesn't know, but you all might know, that uh, Russia and China have been doing joint exercises off the coast of Alaska for some time now. And uh, the first Mainer has died in Ukraine. He joined Ukraine forces and, and was killed. Um, and of course, the, you know, there's no flinching in the media of what the message is and the un unprovoked war and all of that. And what a hero this guy was. And I'm sure, you know, I'm not saying that he wasn't had his own convictions and that's great. But uh, the point being is that we're dragging ourselves into what would be more of a world war, not a proxy war is what it feels like. Do you have any, anything to say on, on some of those, those issues? Yeah, um, you know, while uh, NATO is meeting in its last meeting in Vilnius, Lithuania, uh, there were four very important countries that have nothing to do with the North Atlantic uh, that were invited to that, uh, and those are Asian Pacific countries. And that was uh, South Korea, Japan, New Zealand, and Australia. Yeah. Well, they were invited because while NATO is heavily involved in this war, they are already planning a war with China, just like the U.S. is planning a war with China. And this is just total insanity. And we talk about the corporate media. Well, it's not just that the corporate media has built up a sentiment, an anti-Russian sentiment for years uh, with the Russiagate story, but has been building up an anti-China sentiment for a long time. And some of you might have seen a terrible hit piece that the New York Times did last week uh, against groups like Code Pink uh, and others who are funded by a wealthy entrepreneur from the United States who has moved to China. And he um, is being accused in this piece of being a voice piece for the Chinese government and so he, uh, by total implication of living in China and having gone to a workshop when, you know, silly things like this, um, it's also implied that the groups that he gives to must be voice pieces or agents of the Chinese government as well. And after that hit piece came out, good old Senator Marco Rubio said, this is an atrocity. Those groups like Code Pink must be investigated by the Department of Justice for a violation of what's called the FARA Act, the Foreign Agent Registration Act. I mean, it is McCarthyism all over again. To say that any of us are, uh, ha we don't even have any relationship at all with the Chinese government. We certainly have said good things about China, like their ability to lift hundreds of millions of people out of poverty, we criticize the treatment of the Uyghurs. Uh, we talk about some of their, um, the positive things that they have done overseas, which is not taking their military and invading other countries, but extending very large scale infrastructure projects uh, in Africa and Latin America. Some of them we criticize. They are projects, uh, some of them that have had devastating environmental impacts, and some of them have been very good projects that have improved the lives of people in many poor countries. Um, but to say that we are agents of the Chinese government is just preposterous, but also dangerous, because this shows the creeping nature of this anti-China, anti-Russia sentiment that then labels people that are part of a peace movement as agents of foreign governments. Mm -hmm. And we've seen this in our past and it was not pretty. And we can't let that happen again. So we have a petition on our website with a couple of other groups that says no to this new McCarthyism. We would love you to sign that. But I think your points are well taken uh, that not only do we have to stop this war in Ukraine, we have to stop us from getting into what would be a devastating, devastating war with China. And when the world is crying out for the uh, powers around the, the globe to work together to deal with the existential threat of the climate, um, this is certainly not the time to be making wars with superpowers and nuclear powers. Mm -hmm.
There are about five or six points you brought up in your address, uh, and I'd, be, I'd love to address all of them, but I've got to take one. Uh, the gentleman who was handling the camera brought up something that thought crossed my mind that what we actually have is World War by stealth right now. You know, it's already started, it's been going on. Now, the big problem I've discovered amongst us in the peace movement is internal squabble about how to bring uh, peace to Ukraine. You know, personally, I've caught hell over it, uh, over working with members of Congress. You know, I've gotten a, how dare you even talk to these warmongers. Well, once upon a time, I knew a guy named Tom Cornell. Uh, he was one of the first five guys to bring his draft card. I met him the day before he did a six-month stretch in Danbury. Later on, he came to visit some high school students of mine. Uh, and one of them said, he said one of his best friends was in the Air Force. And the kid said, how could you sit down and break bread with a monster like that? And Tom replied, oh, you're an intolerant pacifist, aren't you? <laughs> so the question I have is how can we in the peace movement stop this intramural squabble and unite so that we can end the suffering of those poor people in Ukraine and uh, the blowback around the world? Yeah, the internal squabbling has been so debilitating because we were a small movement to begin with. I mean, after the big protest movement that we had around Iraq, as time went on, uh, that movement started to fizzle away and war became normalized. Uh, and yeah. so we had few groups that still existed, and now to have those groups squabbling, it, squabbling internally and then squabbling with each other yeah. uh, is really unacceptable as we are moving, moving closer to World War III. And um, I hope that time, uh, as time goes by, there are more and more things we see in common. Because I think you can say to people, look, I'm against sending more weapons to Ukraine, but if you want to keep sending those weapons, at least can we agree that there has to be peace talks? Mm -hmm. And uh, let's agree on that, and let's put our efforts behind, let's say, the Pope. And we have been putting out ads in faith-based uh, publications uh, supporting the Pope and asking the leaders of those churches to talk to, uh, to give sermons about the need for peace talks. Um, we have been talking to environmentalists who have been very difficult to convince on this issue that this could lead to nuclear winter, which would be the end to life on this earth, that this could lead to the blowing up of nuclear power plants. Uh, that this, the blowing up of the Nord Stream pipeline was an environmental disaster. Every day the environment is being ruined with this war, uh, and yet it's been hard uh, to get some of the leaders of the environmental movement to work with us on this issue. But we are trying. Um, we have gotten 1,400 <coughs> mayors uh, that represent mayors throughout this country that are part of a group called uh, the um, U.S. Mayors Conference. And they signed a resolution saying that we have so many needs in our communities for infrastructure, for health care, for better education, yeah. and we can't afford to keep this war up, and so we want you to negotiate a peaceful solution. I mean, that represents millions and millions of people around this country. So why we try to bridge the divide and find some common ground we also have to expand outside the peace movement and look for allies, like in the faith-based movement, uh, allies. Um, I mean, you mentioned an African-American person uh, uh, about the draft issue, right? Is that who, what you said? Uh, no, oh. well, that's okay. Okay, well, I wanted to bring up um, Cornell West as oh, sure. somebody who is running for president, but also to say when the opinion polls are broken down by ethnic groups, what you find is the groups that are most against war traditionally is the black community. And so reaching out to the black community more to uh, show uh, the kind of common issues that we are concerned about and where the money should be going 
And let's face it, it's not just $114 billion that will soon be 140 because Biden's going to get another 24. Uh, it's the trillion dollars for this war business that we are giving now in the last budget uh, that is just taking money that we need so desperately for things here at home. So I think there are other uh, alliances that we can be making and must be making. And uh, the other thing uh, I already said, but to repeat, is I do think that more and more Congress people will start to come our way as they put their fingers in the air and see which way public opinion is going. Um, so I'm optimistic that we are moving towards being able to heal some of those rifts, expand our base, and start putting some effective pressure on people in Congress. Yes. Um, I don't do mention that, um, you know, kind of, this is kind of personal, but the, the Putin's playing chess and we're playing checkers, that he's, he's a guy who's always taking five steps in there. He's got an agenda. He knows what he wants. What is it that he really wants? What, what was his goal? Like, what is it that he really wants? Well, I don't know. I mean, there are some people that say if you looked at the way the war was initiated, he wanted to go to Kiev, he wanted to replace that government with one that was friendly to Russia, uh, and that was his goal. Obviously, that did not happen. Uh, others say, no, that was just a ruse because then they really wanted to take more of the Donbass area and protect the uh, ethnic Russians who were being bombarded in a civil war that had led to the deaths of 14,000 people from the time of 2014 uh, until uh, 10 years later, well, eight years later. Um, and uh, we don't know, we really don't know. Um, what Biden said at one point is uh, he said that Putin needs an off ramp, that he has gotten himself into something that he thought was going to be quick and easy. Uh, and that hasn't happened. Uh, and I would say that Putin needs an off-ramp, that Zelensky needs an off-ramp, that Biden needs an off-ramp, yeah. that we all need an off-ramp. Yeah. And so let's do it. There are so many ways uh, that this is a lose-lose situation except for the weapons industry, the dirty energy companies, and uh, some of the other private industries like the financial company BlackRock that has already signed a memorandum of understanding with Zelensky in Ukraine to be financing the reconstruction. So there are people making money off of you know, uh, uh, blowing things up and people who want to make money uh, off of rebuilding things. Um, but for the majority of people, this is a lose-lose situation. And I do think that uh, Putin does need an off-ramp. And when you think of what are the things that could be compromised, well, I talked about the one in 2015 where, you know, Russia would leave, uh, 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 Ukraine would be neutral. Um, but there are also things that the U.S. and Russia need to talk about. You know, in the last years, um, there are now no nuclear or arms control agreements in effect right now between the U.S. and Russia. And we have to go back to those. And there are, uh, I think, things that the U.S. could do to ease the situation by pulling back from the bases the U.S. has uh, in Poland and in Romania that are very provocative. Uh, to the Russians. Um, there are things that Russia could do, like withdraw uh, its latest um, uh, bringing of, uh, 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 of uh, possible nuclear weapons to Belarus. Um, so there are many things that could be negotiated, should be negotiated. Um, but I would say, you know, I don't know what Putin wanted to do in the beginning, but I think he was not able to do that. And we should think that when people say you're giving in to Putin, we should say, well, we think he's already lost. But I want to end on a positive note, because I did say that we are part of the global majority opinion. I did say that we are part of a changing public opinion here in the United States. And I do think that the members of Congress and the White House are the last ones to come around to the right position on these issues of war and peace. Uh, but that when they do feel the heat, they will start changing. And the heat comes with 
pressure from us the heat comes with election time coming up uh, and so uh, we just want you to do whatever you can and whatever you've done to do a little more uh, because we need some good examples and if we could get somebody from Maine like Shelley Pingree to say I'm going to work on a bipartisan bill um, to do whatever it is, have an audit, have a general inspector, have a report, you know, whatever. Um, there is a, a, an effort people are saying now to audit how the cluster bombs are being used. Yeah. Um, so, you know, there are many different things that we can push them to do. So finally, I just want to do a plug for the book, which is to say um, that, you know, we wrote this book because we knew people needed a background and they needed the elements to be able to talk with their uh, relatives, their colleagues, and their members of Congress. Mm -hmm. And um, that's really why we wrote this. It's a very simple kind of book, but gives you the, uh, the background, the information, the confidence, I think, to speak about this issue or to give to somebody that you've had an argument with on this issue. So I hope some of you will purchase the book. It's $20. If you're low income, it's $10. Or if you really want it for free, you can twist our arms uh, because we really want to get it out. So thank you very much for the thank opportunity. You.